This one is seismic failure of retaining walls. So in this session, I have, there's soil involved. That may be gonna, I even have the word seepage path and internal erosion. And so that should hopefully engage all the geotechs, maybe. Have gates involved, so hopefully something for everyone in this one. Some of the learning objectives is the mechanisms that affect retaining wall failure under seismic loading. And a, a big difference on this one than say the piers is we, it's a retaining wall, so it has soil behind it, and so it's looking at the, the, the seismic soil pressure. And we'll go through a couple different ways to estimate that and some research that's been done regarding the soil load in a seismic event. We'll briefly touch, we've talked a lot about a event tree for reinforced concrete, so we're not gonna go in much detail on this uh, for this potential failure mode. So some of these potential failure modes. So there's three different, three different mechanisms to consider for this. So for the first one, the retaining wall collapses. It overturns from bearing capacity, it slides, or it fails in shear, and this failing, it fails in adjacent gate. So in this case, these retaining walls, we're talking about spillways here that have gates and have water on the gates during the time of the earthquake. So the wall fails and it fails the gates. Then the next one is just the wall deflects excessively and damages the adjacent gate, so much so that you have an uncontrolled release of the reservoir. And this third one is the wall deflects or fails creating a seepage path behind the wall with a, with a, a path to the reservoir. So these first two potential failure modes can, do, can occur quickly without the third one being fully developed. And those first two potential failure modes would be resulting in failure of the gates and a discharge that's limited to the spillway. So just to pictorially go through this, so the you have the uh, embankment dam and the spillway. What's not shown here are the spillway gates. There would be spillway gates if there's water being retained. The step number two, the earthquake damages the spillway wall, which produces an upstream to downstream seepage path connecting into the reservoir. The, uh, the embankment starts to scour, and then we get the progression of the scour. It can't be stopped. The intervention is not successful, and then the embankment fails. So a couple of case histories of this failure mode. This Okarihita Dam in Japan failed during a 2016 earthquake and there was significant damage and offsets to the spillway, including failure of the left retaining wall that you can see here. The reservoir was full at the time of the earthquake, but was drained rapidly, so there was no breach of the reservoir. So I'm not that familiar with this dam, but it looks like it's an uncontrolled, uncontrolled spillway. And so the reservoir was up pretty high near the crest and the failure of the retaining wall uh, where it failed at, there was no seepage path to the reservoir. So they were able to drain the reservoir and there wasn't a breach. So going back to the Shikan Dam that we showed the spillway failure, there was also a failure of the spillway chute wall, which is this counterforded or buttress retaining wall that failed during that same earthquake. Some slightly different numbers here, but again, there was a differential ground movement of around 30 feet and a peak horizontal acceleration of about 0.6 G near the dam. And as you can see here, the spillway shoot wall failed during the earthquake. And we talked about this a little earlier, but it, feels, it appears to be that there was a, a shear failure through the counterforts. And we don't have a whole lot of details on this failure mode and the the pictures are, when you zoom in, you just really don't see any steel in the counterfort members, which is, which is not typical. You would have the vertical bars for bending, and also oftentimes in these, you do have shear reinforcement in these type of, in these type of counterforted walls. So again, this was a spillway chute, so it didn't result in failure of the dam or uncontrolled release of the reservoir, but still an interesting case study of what, of what could happen. And then if we look at Austrian Dam Spillway, this is near Los Gatos Creek in Los Gatos, California. 
and it's a concrete spillway that's located over in the right abutment of the dam. And this happened during the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989 with an estimated peak horizontal acceleration of up to 0.6 G. So the dam, the embankment dam itself, it settled and it spread with a maximum settlement of about 2.8 feet. Well, what this did to the spillway is that the spillway chute elongated as well with it, and there was a elongated about one foot as a result of the embankment deformation. And up to six inch voids were created upstream of the cutoff walls. And the shoot walls, um, the shoot walls deflected inward and which created a, a potential seepage path. So you can see on the, the left, left photo as the embankment settled and you see this uh, large crack up at the top, top of the wall, which would be a case where the, side, the sides went down and the tops, you cracked right there and spread as part of that settlement. And as a result of that, here's that six inch offset behind the wall that could create a seepage path to the reservoir. And that's that area of concern for this failure mode that could, if the, re if the reservoir is up high enough and could create a seepage path, which, which could lead to uh, erosion that would be uncontrolled and then result in the breach of the reservoir and failure of the embankment dam. So some of the key inputs and considerations for this potential failure mode. We again have the reservoir water surface elevation that needs to be considered how often it's on on the spillway gates. We have the hydrodynamic loads from the gates that are transferred into the into the walls. Again, that you saw it's still in the spillway area here, so yeah, the bridges you need to consider in the analysis. A lot of the things we'll focus on is this wall backfill and seismic earth pressures on these retaining walls. And we've already covered the reinforcing moment capacity, shear capacity, and some other other sessions. So again, looking at the bridge. Across these spillways, we covered this last uh, last uh, session, and you heard my thoughts on uh, on bridges and whether they act as a strut or not a strut, or whether they create a whole new potential failure mode if they were to fail. So something that needs to be considered um, in the analysis, and then also would be discussed during the risk analysis as well. So bracing by the spillway gates. These gates may, I'll emphasize may, add some br bracing to adjacent walls. Um, however, the seals and the skin plate form the initial contact with little resistance, and there's often, you know, there's a gap there as well, so the pier has to deflect a certain amount to really even impact the gates. And the gate, uh, I think one of the key factors here is the gate bracing is likely limited and could buckle from the wall loads. My experience is that's probably a little more likely that the, if the piers deflect enough, that it's actually gonna, it's gonna buckle the gates versus the gates being able to add some kind of brace. This particular gate does have some bracing cross stream that a lot of radial, a lot of radial gates don't. So maybe this one is a little stiffer in that cross canyon direction that could add some, some bracing. But again, it's a it's a system here that you need to to consider when in a risk analysis. And again, we're we're pushing this thing to failure, so you're accounting for all the things that are there that could um, could stop the potential failure mode, but you know also considering all these other factors that could contribute to failure modes. So on these retaining walls, a lot of our structures especially when the older structures, when you're getting to be 30, 40 feet plus tall in height, they went to this counter fort, the counter fort wall design. And those counter forts are the, what we saw in the Shikan dam failure that have the counter forts or buttresses for the retaining wall. And there's a couple different failure mechanisms for the counter fort walls. Oftentimes you look at the bending moments on the the soil side at the bottom where you expect the highest moments. You can get a moment failure. There's also a shear. What was attributed to that Shikong was shear. I, I 
I'm bending would have contributed as well, but that failure started here and tipped inward. But you also have the, I guess, wall panel, what spans between the counterforts. That area could fail as well. It's it's pretty thin, a foot or less thickness in those areas. So that can also, when you look at the soil pressure on that spanning between those counterforts, you could get a shear failure or a moment failure for that wall panel as well. So now we're just gonna spend quite a bit of time here on the seismic earth pressures. So it is a critical loading mechanism for spillway, spillway walls. It's related to the interaction of the spillway wall and the backfill. And it's like all these structures, like all these structures, the, the foundation matters, whether you're on rock or soil. And the soil, seismic soil loadings are related to earth pressure theory and the state of wall backfill prior to and during the earthquake. Typically, mononabi okabi or wood solutions are used for screening purposes. Um, so with a show of hands, who all familiar with mononabi okabi to calculate seismic earth pressures? Still only a few, okay. All right. Um, so we're gonna talk about that, how to calculate that um, wood solution. We'll go through that as well. Wood's typically considered to be a more conservative approach. Um, we'll go through those. There's a lot of different assumptions that go into both of these methods. And so typically we start with the Mononabi Okabe, um, but there's a case we gotta look, if you get high seismic loads, then a case where, the, where it says blows up, um, you start getting a square root of a negative number, which is, which is not good. So this is, that usually happens for pretty high seismic accelerations. And again, those are approximate methods. Uh, finite element analysis can be used to model the interaction with the structure and the soil and to come up with the seismic earth pressures. But that's typically reserved for, again, for where you have high risk based on these other approaches. And um, was, again, the highest level, the most time consuming and expensive. So only done kind of as a, as a last resort. So this shows. This shows the setup for Mononabi Okabe. This was done back in, impressive to me, almost 100 years ago, they set up this test. In 1929 in Japan, there was a large earthquake in 1923 that spearheaded this, this, um, this research and this testing to better understand seismic earth pressures. Um, so you can see an elevation view there and a plan view of this box that was nine foot by four foot by four foot. It was able to accelerate up to a 1G G earthquake. It was driven by this uh, winch-driven 30 horsepower electric motor. And they used hydraulic pressure gauges mounted on top to, to measure the earth pressure. So there, there are equations and tables and graphs for calculate the Mononabi Okabe earth pressures, which they're fairly, fairly, straight, fairly straightforward. Um, I would always recommend if you're going to run through this to ask around and see someone, someone of the structurals around may have a, may have a spreadsheet set up to, to calculate some of this stuff, which would be a good start. Of course, checking to make sure that it's all done. Yeah, go ahead. Is there an RMC toolbox for Mononabi Okabe? I think that's a no. No. That is a no. Yep. Okay. Somewhere out there, though, there's some spreadsheets where people have calculated calculated this. So it takes into account the, the it also takes into account the vertical acceleration, as well as the horizontal acceleration. And there's some charts and graphs that um, can help help determine these factors. Uh, one thing to caution in this particular equation is that K A E. That includes both static and dynamic earth pressure effects. And then, but the, the problem with that is that the moment arm is different for the static versus dynamic. And so oftentimes you do have to separate those to get the moment from the, from the static versus the seismic. So there are a lot of assumptions that go, that went into the Mononabi Okabe. Uh, equations that were developed. 
So it assumes a yielding wall with active pressures, a cohesionless backfill. It satisfies the more Coulomb failure criteria. The failure plane, the failure plane and, and backfill occurs along an incline angle and passes through the toe of the wall. No, no liquefaction. Soil wedge behaves as a rigid body and, and accelerations are constant throughout the mass. The backfill is completely above or completely below the water table. So I found, you know, rarely does, does our wall or system meet all these different assumptions. Nonetheless, this uh, is typically is still used as a, a way to estimate the seismic earth pressures. And then there's that limitation mentioned before when when psi, phi, phi is better than psi, greater than psi, then this equation blows up. And like I mentioned, it's uh, you get a um, square root of a negative number inside the equation. And that usually happens around 0.7 G. So that's that's pretty, pretty high for a peak ground acceleration. Um, and at Mononabi Okabe, it starts to increase exponentially as you get up to those higher seismic accelerations. So um, keep an eye on that as well. So then we get into a wood solution, which has some of the main different assumptions. Is this for a, this is for a rigid, non-yielding wall? But this was developed back in 1973, and then displacements um, generate soil stresses in the elastic range. So here are some of the assumptions for that: elastic wave solutions. Uh, one thing to note is around the upper bound is it's about two to three times Mononabi Okabe. And in this case, it gives you the dynamic earth pressure, so you must remember to also include the static earth pressures when using the Woods method. Uh, one of the to use the graphs and tables, this is a function of the soil Poisson's ratio, and this was also a function of L over H. So in the figure there on the left, L is the length of the soil behind the wall, and H is the height of the wall. And so a lot of times, again, the, the assumptions on your, your wall, whether it's completely rigid or there's some movement elastic capability, um, sometimes depends on whether you want to use Mononabi Okabe or woods. Um, this method is recommended for rigid walls that are embedded in very firm soil or in rock. So for a wood solution, some of these variables that may not be able to see too well, but Poisson's ratio, is one of the one of the big factors to be able to use these graphs and then the L over H value. And then also something to note on the stress is the parabolic shape of the stress. And again, a lot of that, a lot of that load is higher up in the structure and we'll compare that later to Mononabi Okabe and some of the other methods. So some other testing and research that's been done to try to determine the seismic earth pressures was a centrifuge test and experiment. This was performed by Sitar and Alatik at the University of California. And they modeled both uh, centrifuge modeling, so physical modeling, but also numerical modeling of U-shaped retaining walls that were conducted and they were using sand backfill. The models were subjected to ground motion and earth pressures and moments in the walls were measured. So part of their research, they were looking at some case histories and, and throughout their research noted that walls that were retaining dry soils, dense soils, and clay soils performed very well for peak horizontal accelerations as high as 0.5 to 0.6 G. And a lot of that was based on some of the, um, the, the earthquakes in California in recent history. Also noted that loose cohesionless saturated soils subject to liquefaction could cause problems for retaining structures. So this just shows a layout of their, of their model testing. You can see the extents of the shake table. They had a stiff wall here, and then they also modeled a flexible wall here at the same time, and they had a lot of different measuring devices throughout the Throughout the, um, throughout the testing frame. So some of the results here, I'm going to read from the notes as there's, it's not apparent from the, from the figure here, but what they determined from this was that the wall inertial moments, it contributed to the overall dynamic wall moments and it's substantial and it needs to be accounted for. This would be the, the, weight, the weight of the wall. They should always be 
included when you're looking at any type of structure, the self weight and it's being excited to with the earthquake. But they noted from this that it contributed significantly. The wall inertial moments were generally in phase with the dynamic wall moments. And however, the maximum earth pressures and the maximum wall moments are were out of phase. And this was the case for both the stiff and the flexible walls. So note here, or we'll note on the next one that uh, we'll note it here and see it on the next slide that earth pressure distributions are triangular, increasing from zero at the top of the wall to the maximum pressure at the base of the wall. And it was noted that earth pressures on the walls were less than those predict predicted by Manunabi Okabe. And the differences was greater for the more flexible walls than for the stiffer walls. So here you can see in this plot, it's just mainly showing that um, the dark, the bold black line, that's Manunabi Okabe. And then you can see the different results from the centrifuge testing that it's uh, fairly significantly less than what you'd calculate from Mononabi Okabe. And again, the stress distribution where you, know, you would expect for soil loading, for static soil loading, where the pressures are the greatest at the bottom. And so part of that research they did, there was also numerical modeling as well. And so what we're seeing here on the top figure is the in the solid line is the centrifuge experimental results and then you can see in uh, the dash lines you can kind of see the difference between those the dash lines were the finite element results so you can see that those were typically a little higher than the experimental results and the uh, bureau of reclamation did some ls dyna modeling of this same configuration to see to see if they would get similar results as well. Um, you can kind of see just by the scale of eight times 10 to the, 10 to the, can't hardly see that even on my screen, 10 to the seven, that the LS Dyna modeling by reclamation is, is a little higher than what was seen from the centrifuge testing and some of that finite element modeling. But keep in mind, we've talked about going to the finite element modeling approach that is uh, much more time consuming and costly than the simplified methods. So talking a little bit more about these finite element nonlinear models, in particular, this one's LS Dyna. The full embankment dam and foundation were included in the model and plastic kinematic materials were used. The reinforced concrete and the rebar was modeled using nonlinear material properties. And while we saw the crest structure walls may crack and some of the reinforcement may yield, but loads are distributed and the walls may remain stable. Again, that's the, the benefit that we're seeing from the nonlinear models is to understand the cracking and uh, look at complete failure. Uh, the soil is modeled with nonlinear properties in this case. The contact surfaces are provided between the wall and the soil backfill. And again, with these models, a significant amount of time and effort is needed to verify these models. Sensitivity analysis are also critical to evaluate changes in the soil properties and the models. So here's a case this shows it's, that was an introduction to this finite element model and what you're seeing here for this particular spillway where we have we saw a screenshot last one last session but this is looking at the retaining walls and it has a center pier so in this model they're actually modeling the foundation down to a certain level they're modeling the backfill out to some extent to see that full propagation of the earthquake through the foundation and into the structure uh, my experience and my experience is it's, it's very time consuming to model this and then the processing time. The processing time I've seen, I mean, it depends on how big your mesh size is. There's so many dependents on this, but these can take days, if not weeks to run. And that's, I don't know, maybe the, maybe the Corps of Engineers has better, better computers and better processing capabilities, but at reclamation, we are oftentimes limited by the, the time it took to do these analysis. And another thing to caution here on this is 
how many earthquakes are you are you going to look at to evaluate? We talked about, or Keith talked about a couple sessions ago about the time histories, and I think he mentioned, you know, to need a hundred of those to really understand to be able to scale those time histories, and that's that's not possible. But in reclamation, we oftentimes required a minimum of three time histories to run these analysis, and then they run those. They provide time histories in both directions, so that's six right there. And then you can start talking about the long period and the short period and those time histories. And so you can start out just getting, to start out with an enormous amount of time histories to try to run through. And then you put those into a model that takes days, if not weeks, to run. And then there's troubleshooting all along the way that it's, it's an incredible amount of time that it can take to run through all these analyses. Um, so, wanted to, to point that out to, when you're looking at taking this into a risk analysis to be able to think about all the different branches for all the different load ranges and for the pool elevations that there really needs to be a lot of discussion and coordination early on of what 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 can be what can be analyzed in a realistic amount of time and what information is going to be needed to go into that risk analysis. So some finite element results versus the sitar halitic research. So while sitar's research indicates that accepted methods may overstate earth pressure loads on the walls, the finite element studies of spillway crust structure indicate that earth pressures can be greater or less than the accepted methods. So how's that for inconclusive of being able to use that to project on future? So sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's, it's lower. The primary differences between Sitar and the FLAC and Alistina finite element models are those various geometries and backfill conditions where the crest structures, various foundation conditions, and finite element studies have indicated that earth pressure is approaching a passive condition for spillways adjacent to rock abutment, so could be even higher in those situations. Again, I guess from my, uh, my experience, it um, comes a lot from being the the team lead, the technical lead, uh, project manager, different terms of this, but coordinating the entire effort of this issue evaluation to be able to take all this information into a risk analysis, being able to write up this report, a technical report of findings to be able to justify this to decision makers, to our clients, uh, you know, what the heck does 5.8 times 10 to negative five, what does that really mean? So from my experience, I, I would just really emphasize the communication between these different levels are needed. So you have your seismologists developing seismic loads. What are they giving to the analysts to, to be able to analyze? I, I've, I've, noted, I've, I've seen it where the assumptions by the analysts were not matching up with what the seismologists were providing and those discussions, because you saw just how complicated the seismology is. Um, and again, the number of earthquakes that were given. So I had a case where we didn't have time to run six different time histories in two different directions and consider long sh period, short period. So the analysts looked at the time histories, took the worst case, the ones with the highest peaks, and, and ran with that. So that's, that's conservative. It, and you get conservative results, but we're in a risk analysis. And you know, really, if, you, if that's happening, there really should be a lower bound. The one that has the smallest one should also be run, in my opinion, but it gets into a timing, a timing issue. And then what the analyst produce and either gives to a designer who's going to look at further something or to the risk analysis team, there's oftentimes there needs to be communication of what they're getting from their models, where they're looking at the highest stresses. Is that where you're anticipating the highest stresses to be? And so... I just emphasize the communication along all the different steps. Quite a few people, different groups touch these analyses um, in the, to, to be able to get to a risk analysis. And one thing also, I, you know, this is, my, this is my, my opinion here, but there's a lot of conservatism that can be added on each step along the way. Nobody wants to we're trained as that as engineers. We're not going to, we don't want to be unconservative. But when you have the seismologists adding in uncertainty, is, are they adding that in like factors of safety in what they're doing? Or are they properly showing that this is the mean and they're giving you bounds? Or are they adding a little bit of conservatism? The analysts, like I mentioned, just, I don't have time to run all these earthquakes, so I'm going to pick the worst case. And then I'm going to run some material properties that 
are concerned on the conservative end. And then you get to the risk analysis and the risk analysis team I've seen oftentimes take more of a conservative approach because there's still unknowns involved. And so oftentimes I see or hear that, well, we don't know, so we should just be conservative. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not convinced that's the approach in a risk analysis. We don't know, we should take our best estimate. We shouldn't just use the minimum compressive strength and run with that. We, could, we should look at what it's expected and then account for this uncertainty. Be conservative in the uncertainty and unconservative in your, in your high estimates. And to, just to note that if, if everyone's adding in their own conservatism, it can, you can drive up the risk on something that's not, nece not necessarily should have a high risk. So that's my thoughts, that's my experience on some of those, so something to, to be aware of. Um, so one more time, one last time, an example of entry. This one is follows the same reinforced concrete uh, failure modes. There's just a couple there at the end that if um, the displacement of the gate, um, you got to look at whether that displacement of the piers is enough to fail the gate, which would result in an uncontrolled release of the reservoir. And then you also are looking at when you have enough deflection that doesn't fail the gates, or maybe it fails the gates, but can you get a seepage path to the reservoir? Can internal erosion happen behind that wall? That would have a much more catastrophic failure of the embankment dam. So some takeaway points is uh, gated spillway walls, retaining embankment soils are subject to increased loading during seismic shaking. And if water is stored against the gates at the time of the earthquake, the potential failure modes and consequences do exist. And if loading causes excessive deformation or collapse of the wall, then the adjacent gate could fail and or a seepage path could open up. Um, and evaluation of the stability of the walls, including seismic earth pressures, is often needed to evaluate the risk posed by these potential failure modes. So. That gets to the end. Are there any questions? Any questions for Adam? I'll answer Adam's question about uh, finite element analysis and whether the core is concerned about how long it takes and how many records to run. Um, yeah. <laughs> as well as the lead time to get up and running and trained and people um, well indoctrinated into the process. Right, Cody? <laughs> we do have high performance computing capabilities, I hear. So some of these big models where you're modeling the entire dam, um, can they, are this down to days to run or is it still, you can take weeks for a whole time history that lasts? Yeah, they add to exactly they make it more complicated to which is our finer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other questions or comments for Adam? Okay. All right. Thanks, Adam.